when we did our, when I did my first webinar, and I don't know if it's just because you guys, this is a mandatory credit, or if maybe you liked this last time. So uh, I know everyone in our office is really glad to have this partnership with Michigan Center for Rural Health. So I'm glad to be a part of it. So when um, we talk about pediatric assessment, we know that this is a mandatory part of what uh, we have to have for our education at all levels. And it's because it's really important. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Just for your background for me, I am a paramedic. I have been for 17 and a half years. So it does come from a little bit of real provider perspective when I speak to you guys. So sometimes you'll hear me give you some real truth. It's not um, the state EMS office talking, it's Emily the paramedic talking. So um, what are we gonna talk about today? Well, we're going to talk about some differences between children, and I know we get this hammered into our heads over and over and over again, and we'll talk about differences in age groups and also differences with children and adults. We'll talk about some specific respiratory uh, assessment things that we need to think about, um, some findings and causes of issues that those present to us. We're going to talk about circulatory assessments, which I think really is probably the most different part about kids. And then we'll touch on the pediatric assessment triangle as well. So those are the things that we'll chat about. And then at the very end, I actually have a few videos for us to look at where we can actually see some sick kids and uh, chat a little bit about those. So when I was preparing for this, I thought, you know, when we deal with kids, there are a lot of us who are scared, to be honest, and that it goes for parents and providers who don't have kids alike. And I when you think about why that is, one, because they're cute and we don't want them to be sick, but two, they're a really small population um, compared to what we see. So when we look at like statewide data, I actually got this out of my MSIS. Um, in 2017, we transported about 1.18 million patients statewide in the state of Michigan. Um, and 8% of those, so a pretty small number, were transported lights and sirens. So when you look at that number, most of our patients are not super sick because when we talk about transports, that also includes interfacility transfers. So of those patients, the 1.18 million, 6.43% only, where 41,000 of them were actually children, which is like 18 and under. Um, 1,182 were under a year old. And if you look at this, per, the proportion here, where you see 761 of those 1,182 were transported lights and siren, that is actually a significantly greater percentage. So, you know, that is about 60% of the less than one year old patients that are transported lights and siren. And I found that really, really interesting because it could mean a couple of things. One, the kids that we are seeing are more sick, which kind of makes sense. Kids can't call 911 for themselves. So we aren't seeing kids necessarily that are having um, non-emergency situations in ambulances. And secondarily, because we're not as comfortable with them, we may be, have tendencies to transport them like and siren more often than we would for older kids. It's interesting. As you go older in age, the percentage of like and siren goes down. Um, so you see 6,191 are between the ages of one and nine. So you see 2,000 of those were transferred license sirens. So you go from like 60% to a third. So around 33% there. And then in the teenage, preteen years, the 10 to 18 year olds, that's 13,678 of our patients or 3,378. So that holds right around a quarter. So you see, like we go from 60% to 30% to 25%. It's, it's just interesting to me. But what the real sticker there is, is only about a half a percent of the patients that we see in a year are quote unquote sick kids. So kids that we are transporting lights and sirens to the hospital. This is why we hammer education on kids is because we don't see them very much. When it comes to our adult patients, we develop a kind of a rote repetition because we see them over and over and over again. But with kids, we just don't have the opportunity to develop that. Even uh, providers that I talk to that see kids on a regular basis, survival flight, for example, they see a lot more kids than we do. They still have to go through a lot more training and a lot more practice outside of true patient 
situations in order to be proficient at those skills. So that's what we kind of have to keep in mind. So what's interesting about kids, they're different and they're variable. So you can't just say all pediatrics are because when they're born, they're one way, and when they transition into adult, they're a completely different creature. And that's what's fascinating, too. I have a lot of nieces and nephews, and you'll hear me refer to them a lot. Um, and I don't get to see them every day because they're not super local to me. And I feel like from one time to I see them to the next time, they're completely different humans. And that goes all the way down to their anatomy as well. So they have different anatomy. We'll talk about what, what presents us that way. They have different vital signs, meaning the vital signs that we take on an adult, if we apply them to a kid, it's not the same and it shouldn't tell us the same thing. And they have different abilities to communicate with us. So we can't just look at a kid and say, hey kid, what's happening? And expect them to give us a good picture of what's truly going on. So this is why we have to talk about it a lot is because there are a lot of different things that can go on. So when we talk about the anatomy of these kids, and we hear this over and over and over again, but it, you really, if you look at a kid, this is the most transparent thing. They have these ginormous heads in proportion to their body. Like they're small little people and then they have these big heads. And that means a lot to us. One, that is where if you think of an adult who has a full head of hair, loses 10% of their body heat through their head. If you, know, you make that head a lot bigger and you remove all of its insulation, we have to think about the fact that they're gonna lose a lot of heat as a kid through their head. And this is something, and before I actually um, get too far into this, this has been coming up a lot lately for us as an office. We've been seeing issue after issue with um, kids and people are focusing a lot on you know, blood pressure, and we'll talk about that down the road here, but, and they're not getting a temperature. For kids, temperature is really a, critical thing, especially the smaller, smaller ones. So we have to remember that they're losing a lot of heat through their heads. So we need to put half on them and we need to take their temperature and get an accurate one for them as part of our assessment because of this particular situation. And so, yes, if you don't have a baby hat, we do expect you, and this has happened all over the state, take your hat off your head and put it on theirs because it's a lot easier for you to handle it than for them. Um, also because of this large head, they fall head first. This is a mechanism of injury thing for us to think about. When kids fall, they have a tendency, like adults will stick their arms out to catch themselves. And so we see a lot of fractures that way, or they hit their shoulder first or something. Kids, one, don't have that instinct, and two, they have these heads that kind of lead with all of the time. So that you'll see a lot more head injury situations with them. Um, and you know, toddlers are called toddlers for a reason. It's because they toddle. And it takes a kid pretty pretty long, actually, to get to the point where they are proficient with walking and able to stick their arms out and catch themselves. They also, with their lovely giant head, can obstruct their own airway. This is um, from first day of CPR, really. You're getting told over and over and over again about the sniffing position and making sure that you're opening a child's airway proportionately because their heads are big, it'll roll over and kind of crunch their airway down. So that is the, the head situation. The bone structure of a kid is not as developed. What I mean by that is, you know, we're born with one number of bones and then over time they all kind of fuse together and become hard. And kids don't break their bones very often. They're very, very bendy meaning when something happens to them, their bones won't necessarily fracture. And this, this is something that we have to take home when we think about kids, when something happens to them traumatically, you can't say, oh, well, they don't have a distracting fracture or I don't see an obvious injury. You have to think about what's under that bone as opposed to just thinking about um, the absence or presence of a fracture. So, you know, you might see on an adult, you'll see a rib fracture and you know to think, okay, well, there's probably some sort of underlying chest injury with a kid. They will squish pretty good before you start to see any sort of injury that way. So you have to think about that. Um, the second port, part, like the moving forward with that is that if you do see a fracture on a child, that is a lot of mechanism. It takes a lot of mechanism of injury to 
cause a fracture in a kid, especially with the younger ones. So keep that in mind. A fracture isn't just a fracture with a kid. You know, an adult can fracture an ankle and it be no thing. But when you see a smaller kid who has an ankle fracture, that's a significant mechanism of injury. The airway is easier to obstruct. We talked about that a little bit with their head, but it also has other components to it. So their proportionate larger head also comes with a proportionately larger tongue, which means they can actually obstruct their own airway. And we'll see actually in our video later what kids have a tendency to do when they have a, a tongue situation, but they can actually obstruct their own airway. Their trachea is uh, flexible and less structured. So where we have you touch your Adam's apple or run your hand up and down your trachea, you can feel that um, kind of cartilaginous ring and texture. And there's a pretty good amount of resistance if you try to push on that. With a kid, that's not that way. It's much more like a, a bendy straw situation without a whole lot of structure to hold it up. So that combined with that whole large head situation makes it very, very easy for them to kink off their airway. Then their larynx or the lead up part to their trachea is funnel shaped. This is why kids choke. So like an adult, once it's there, it either goes all the way down or they can get it out. It's kind of a straight pipe straight through and it's really obvious to see what's going to fit and what's not. And I mean, no, we don't want something in your lungs, but I'd rather have it in your lungs and blocking off some bronchioles than obviously blocking off your whole airway. Kids, when they get it in there, it will actually wedge because there's a funnel shape. So if they, if they try to keep swallowing or they try to keep pushing it back, it will actually wedge further and further down there and it won't pass through. So this is uh, why we have such a hard time and why we need to, you know, for food and stuff, chop, chop things up so small because their inside airways are smaller than their outside airways. And that's something that we forget a lot, a lot. Um, Infants breathe through their nose, they're obligate nose breathers, and we talk about that a lot when we talk about them being born, right? When we suction their airways, we talk about why we clear their nose first, but this translates all the way through until they start really being better at breathing through their mouth, because when you see an infant get sick, and not something that would normally make a bigger kid really sick, like a cold, for example, if their nose is completely plugged up and they can't breathe through their nose and they're obligate nose breathers, they're going to have a problem. How do they eat, for example? If they can't flush and eat and breathe at the same time, it creates a lot of issues for an infant. That's what the anatomy portion is. So when we talk about the vitals of a kid, it's a fascinating thing. and until I was around kids a little bit more often, I don't think I really quite understood it. But when they're little, everything is faster. And that is like my rule of thumb for kids. So if you see a kid and it is slow, it is way more concerning anything, whether it's respiratory rate or heart rate, those things, if you see that slow in a kid, it's very, very concerning because it should be faster. Little kids have high heart rates and high respiratory rates, and that is what we should expect. Um, and then as they get bigger, they get closer and closer to normal. And that is pretty good thing to know. The other thing to know about a kid in heart rate is that they can change a lot based on really small things. Heart rates are a lot more transparent than blood pressure for us, which we'll talk about that when we talk about circulation. But Keep in mind that these are huge range, right? So 60 beats per minute different is pretty normal for a kid. But I can tell you that when my niece was sick and she was in the hospital, one of the nurses person clipped the 12 lead cable on her skin and her heart rate jumped from 170 to 220 just with that pain. So we have to keep in mind that there are a lot of variables that go into what makes a little kid's heart rate change. And then for their blood pressures, it should be lower. And that should make sense to you guys, especially people who have any kind of experience with, uh, honestly, motors. I always think about the circulatory system and motors because pressure makes things go around. And when you have a smaller container with less resistance, it takes less pressure for things to circulate. And so that's why littler kids, you don't have to see these huge high blood pressures. 
for them. But you also think about it from the perspective of if your highest systolic blood pressure is only 75, um, one, it's really hard to hear, which is why we don't usually take it. Um, and two, you don't have a whole lot of distance to go down. So when we talk about vital signs in kids, we don't think about them quite as reliably as we do in adults, and that's okay. That's why we talk a lot more about the pediatric assessment triangle and other tools for kids so that we can find something that's a little bit more reliable and a little bit more consistent than a vital sign might be. So with all of that anatomy and physiology behind us, we have to kind of talk about what, what communicating with kids is like. And this is a totally fascinating thing to me, and I've seen it a lot of times in students, is that kids, when you're uncomfortable around them, they're uncomfortable around you. They can kind of sense it when you feel anxious or you feel worried or you feel uncomfortable with them. You really, really kind of pass that vibe onto a child. And so it's important that you as a provider get comfortable with kids. And I know that sounds completely, completely crazy, but you have to spend time with them because part of telling what is sick about a kid is knowing what a not sick kid is. So you, you learn by experiencing them. So spend time with your nieces, nephews, cousins, kids, um, neighbors, whoever, so you can kind of experience the gamut of different different kids and how they act and how they behave. The second part I try to reiterate is talking to them as people and on their level as much as you can, right? Obviously infants, we can't talk to them like people all the time because they're just tiny babies. But when it comes to kids who can actually verbalize things, this is their experience too. And yes, you're gonna have to deal with their parents because we'll talk about parents and they get a little, a little unruly sometimes. But they're having an emergency too. And if you talk to them on their level and you speak with them, you might get a lot more information out of them that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Uh, use your manners, they go a long way. I, I say this because once again, we're in a situation when we're talking about a sick kid that we're not comfortable, we're upset. The kid is upset, the parent is upset. It's really a pretty tough situation. Um, it's hard to remember to use our manners, but kids are taught from the time they're tiny to use your manners and trust people who are nice to you and all that other business with our uniforms, et cetera, and not necessarily strangers, but it does go a long way. If you talk nicely to the child and ask them to do things nicely, they do have a tendency to be better behaved with you. Acknowledge that things are scary. When you say it's no big deal to them, they're just going to look at you like, um, yeah, okay, ma'am or sir, this is actually pretty scary because there are all these things going on. So acknowledge that it's a scary experience for them. Use praise to help them continue cooperating. Uh, it's really, really important that you say you're doing a great job even if they're maybe not doing that great of a job to keep them coming along with you. Kids the really, really sick ones, right? The ones who are unconscious and stuff, we might not have to worry about this, but the ones who are working their way in that direction, if we want to know what's going on with them and we want to be able to find all of the things and help them, we need them to kind of be on our team. So use praise, be nice to them. It'll go a long way. Um, when it's possible, assess the patient using the parent as a tool. So, um, Talk to the parent, yes, but also talk to the kid so that they don't feel like they're tertiary to your assessment. And use the parent as a tool, and I'll talk about this several times. I will say this over and over and over again. The parent, 99% of the time, is your best asset when it comes to kids because nobody knows that kid better than the parent does. So if the parent says that's not going to work or if the parent says that child is uh, scared of you because they had an abusive parent with a beard, someone else to assess the parent with those patients who doesn't have a beard, things like that. Use the parent as your tool and as your asset. So um, they also are really, really, really aware of what a kid looks like or what is normal for a kid. 
So when you are dealing with a child, they might be different than what you expect. So let's take a four-year-old child, for example. We would expect in an emergency situation for that kid to be a little bit shy and not talk to us and be a little resistant for our assessment. But then the parent says the patient or the child is normally really gregarious and super outgoing and this is normal for them has to raise the red flag. Because even though we would normally expect the kid to be different to us than the parent, if the parent says that's not normal, trust that that is not normal and go with the fact that something is wrong. It is generally better to assume that something is wrong and have there be nothing than the other way around. Ask for assistance or ideas that the child has special needs. Um, this picture on the bottom right corner of your screen here, I think it's on your right corner too. That's my nephew, his name is Lawrence, and he's six and he is autistic. And there is nothing about looking at that child that would make me know that he is autistic until you tried to deal with him. And then you would run into some circumstances that might not be so great. Um, no. But those of us who know him know what will work and what will not as far as getting getting okay. them to a do things or b talk to you he does have limited words and he can't tell um tell you certain things but the part of that that goes along with it is that if the child is nonverbal, you can't also assume that they can't communicate or they're dumb there are a lot of different tools out there we're actually working on nonverbal communication cards in our office to try to distribute but talk to the parents or the caregivers or whoever to see if there's anything that they know that will help or if there's a specific way that they usually like to communicate. So with Lawrence here, for example, that is my dog, Belle, and he will tell anything to Belle or Patch, my two dogs, whereas he might not talk to a grown human. So not that you'll have a dog everywhere, but that's a weird random fact that he talks to the animals more than he talks to any of the humans. So. And he hears everything we say because he, he repeats it, but that is an interesting tidbit as far as caregivers go. Never, never lie to a kid. It always absolutely kills me if someone, if a kid says, is this going to hurt and it's going to hurt, you need to tell them that it's going to hurt. Yes, it's going to hurt, but it's only going to hurt for a minute and then it will be better in the long run. This is a really hard thing and some of our treatments are changing, so we won't have to do it as much, but you have a kid who's really sick and is having pain and you have to cause them more pain in order to give them medicine. The important thing is you have to say, yes, this is going to hurt. This is a shot and it's going to hurt. Because if you lie to them, they're never going to believe you again. And it may not be just you. It may be every healthcare provider for a long, long time. So don't lie to them. Be honest, be straightforward because uh, they're smart enough to know that you're lying. So with all of that said, we'll talk a little bit about respiratory specific things. Um, there are some really specific conditions and I, it's in quotation marks because there are more instances now of some of these occurring in older adults because of different environmental situations that we have going on in our universe. Um, but as a rule, you won't see these outside of certain age ranges. So we're gonna talk about crew epiglottitis and bronchiolitis or RSV um, and why we're going to focus a lot on this in our assessment presentation is because with kids 90 percent of the time our problem is respiratory cause they don't have primary cardiac events it is a respiratory condition until proven otherwise and it's really important that we recognize what it is and what we can do for it so they don't end up in the a whole different situation. So speaking specifically about croup, croup is, uh, yeah, look at that long word. Technically my medical uh, terminology professor would say that's laryngotracheobronchitis because they do a hard G, but we'll just call it croup. Um, it is viral in nature. What that means for us is antibiotics do not help for it. And Honestly, in the last couple of years, we have seen more and more instances of croup being more significant, meaning when I was a new paramedic and when I went through school, we didn't, we didn't really treat croup. It was just something that we knew about, we talked about it, 
but it rarely, quote unquote, got to a point where we had to worry about these kids being um, hospitalized. So that has kind of changed and now we're having, we're seeing more and more instances of this cough, croupy cough, turning into an actual respiratory obstruction. So because of the inflammation in this tiny airway, if it's not handled appropriately, it can actually cause them to completely constrict their airway shut, which is uh, obviously a really significant situation, which is why we've added um, racemic epinephrine statewide to the protocol. Um, okay. So then the next one we're going to talk about is epiglottitis. And this one is one that we have seen more in adults. So the change we've seen in epiglottitis is that now it used to be a kids only thing. We just didn't see it in grown humans. And now it is coming uh, and appearing more in adults. So that's kind of an interesting tidbit on this one. Epiglottitis, what's interesting about this is it is bacterial in nature. So you'll see some high fevers and stuff with it you will not usually see a cough with it. Uh, it does go across all kinds of age ranges, but this kid on the right hand side of your screen, I know that picture is not super great, but it is a pretty accurate depiction. They have a tendency to kind of hang their mouth open and just let the drool come out. And what, why that's happening is if you guys know what the epiglottis is way back there, and it's kind of that flip floppy structure in the back of your throat, that goes between swallowing and breathing. And it is a super important structure because it directs where things are supposed to go. So what happens in epiglottitis is that thing gets bacterially infected. And if you are interested, there are actually some um, interesting pictures online from different airway procedures where you can see it. And the whole thing swells up. It swells up and so the whole back of their airway is full of this highly inflamed little structure and so it's painful they can't really swallow without a whole bunch of discomfort and because it's so large it covers up their airway so this is a really epiglottitis is a pretty scary thing fortunately it is treatable obviously with um, antibiotics but it is a really important thing for parents and caregivers to recognize because it can also lead to this full airway obstruction. So the last pediatric specific condition that I'm gonna talk about is bronchiolitis and RSV. Now this one is the one that I've learned a lot about over the last uh, few months really because this is what put my niece in the hospital in the NICU at six weeks old in January of this year. So it is something that I am am amazed to see this year has been a terrible year for the providers that I've talked to at the hospital. But RSV in a grown person or an older child is nothing more than a cold. It's a cold. And in a small infant, right, remember what we talked about before, with those tiny noses that they breathe through all of the time, it creates so much mucus that they're just, in essence, choking constantly. And then they get so tired from trying to breathe that they actually stop breathing. So this particular condition starts out as a cough and the parents are like, okay, this child has a cold and they have a runny nose and then they progress, they stop feeding well, they start with this wheezing, they start turn blue and they literally will just stop. They just quit breathing entirely because they're so tired. So it's a pretty scary uh, progression of things and it's a pretty scary circumstance to see, see a kid like this, but they do show these um, symptoms where you can look at a kid and know that they're in a pretty significant amount of distress. And the real, the real treatment for this is nothing more than respiratory support. So this is your BVM and careful bagging, and that is you clear the airway in essence through pressure. So. We'll see a video actually of my niece here towards the end of um, of the presentation. So that's RSV. Um, as far as circulation goes, and this is the one, like I said, this is the one that I think betrays us the most with kids because from day one of school, we learn how to take a blood pressure and we talk about what makes up a blood pressure and 
why it's important and all of these different levels that are great. And with little kids, the blood pressure is kind of a lie. And that's because they're really good at compensating. If you think about uh, compensating as far as shock goes, they can do a really good job of keeping their blood pressure up for a long, long time because their vasculature is really good and their heart is generally really, really strong. And that's what makes up a blood pressure. So they can keep making their container smaller and keep making their heart rate go up and keep that blood pressure up until it is way past the point where you should have recognized that something was going on. So we really focus on looking at the kid instead. Yes, if you have time, sometimes take blood pressure. Yes, if the kid is 12 years old, take a blood pressure. But when you're looking at these kids that are a year old, two years old, six months old, the blood pressure is something that's like tertiary and way down the road for the circulatory assessment. Look at their capillary refill. Why is that important? Well, as I previously stated, these kids compensate by vasoconstriction, right? They chunked everything in just like everybody else does. So when they close those vessels down and bring their blood volume to their core, their little fingertips will tell you pretty quick. So you can do an accurate assessment to check their circulatory status, I should say, for those of you in Michigan like us right now, um, when they're warm. <laughs> When they're warm, cap refill is a really great assessment tool. Um, if it, they're not warm, you can always, like I said, warm their hand up. And if it doesn't come back, that is a, a strong indicator. Look at their actual colors. Kids don't have a whole lot of callus, a whole lot of, um, I guess, grizzling on their skin. I was a lifeguard for a long time, so my skin is a little tougher than most people's. But kids don't have that yet. It's almost transparent, right? You can almost see through them. They're soft, their skin is thin, their vasculature you can see really, really easily. You can tell when they get pale. You can tell when they turn blue pretty easily. What is their behavior? What are they acting like? Um, are they more lethargic? Are they less lethargic? Are they eating inappropriately? Are they behaving in the way that they're used to? And if if they look abnormal to you, or even if they don't, and you have a parent around, ask and see what the comparison is. Like if this circumstance were to happen and it was someone else in the situation, how would this kid be behaving? What would we be expecting? I actually had a pretty sick kid the other day and the mom just kept saying, she's trying to take a nap and it's not time for her nap. And I was like, well, that is a really interesting thing to kind of unpack because that is lethargic, right? This kid is lethargic. And then the kid actually ended up having a blood sugar of like 18, which with no history of diabetes. So there you go. Because that mom felt uncomfortable and we trusted that the mom knew what, what it was for this kid. We were able to pretty easily rectify that particular circumstance. But otherwise, if we take the... Um, grizzled approach where we don't listen to the mom or you're like mom you're overreacting we might not necessarily have found that um, and then the last part about that circulatory assessment same thing goes for grown people as it does for kids if the cap refill is not good right if we know it's not good whether it's because they're cold or because they're not circulating blood volume at all um, you can't use the pulse box right it only works if you have uh, capillaries to read so make sure you keep that in mind so what about this pediatric assessment triangle? I um, kind of as a paramedic student, and maybe even as I had more years of experience, I've kind of downplayed the pediatric assessment triangle because it just is what it is. But the pediatric assessment triangle, because kids are what they are, this like transparent look at them, is really important so you don't get distracted by all of the other things that can be going on. So when you look at it, this is a quick look. So if you think about your national registry test, if you are one of those people who took that particular test, the practical test, that um, initial impression line, that one where you're just supposed to say, I see uh, whatever age, whoever looking like whatever, this is exactly what the pediatric assessment triangle is. I am looking at the patient. This is from the second that I walk in the room. This is my clinical eye looking at a child and saying, how sick do they look? 
And what am I putting into that picture? There's three pieces are the appearing. What are they doing? Their work of breathing. How are they breathing? And what does their skin look like? So our appearance, the tone, if a baby who is supposed to be awake or is being jostled is just flaccid, like just droopy, like limp noodle. Babies generally aren't limp noodles. Even when they're sleeping, they have a tendency to kind of bring their uh, appendages towards the core. So that is a, if it is laying like limp noodle, that's a bad sign. How interactive are they being? Say if you're a first responder and you see how their parent is trying to stimulate the child, or if you're a transporting agency and you're trying to see how the child is interacting with the first responders, that's what you're looking at. Consolability, is the parent or whoever able to console that child? So if they are wailing and thrashing around and they can't be consoled by normal means, there's probably something else going on. Because like I said earlier, when you have a baby, for example, with pain, how do you know a baby has pain? You can't ask the baby if they have pain. They won't point to where they have pain, but they will give you this inconsolable writhing around business for you to use in your pediatric assessment triangle. Work of breathing. When we talk about the work of breathing, this is where you use your eyes and your ears. You can hear them breathing. And um, in my presentation, we do the videos. We'll talk a little bit about what, um, what the noises are that we're hearing in the videos but it is a look at them, look for retractions, look for what are they doing with their mouth, look at the look on their face and see if it looks like they're having a hard time. Um, and then listen, listen to see if they are making a whole lot of noise. And a good rule of thumb for you to take through your entire EMS career is if you walk into a room and you can hear someone breathing, it's a bad sign. Breathing, you shouldn't hear unless you're really focusing on it. So if you can hear them from outside a room, if you can hear them as you walk into a room and they're making some sort of noise, that's abnormal. And then the last piece is the circulation. We talked about the skin appearance. Is it blue? Is it pale? Is it sweaty? Like how much do kids sweat? Not usually very much, right? So these are abnormal things. Or if we see any obvious bleeding. So in, honestly, I just spent a couple of minutes talking about this particular pediatric assessment triangle. They have whole classes on the pediatric assessment triangle and the whole thing in an assessment takes like half a second. It's literally just half a second. And the good practice thing to do is uh, if you do a Google search for uh, pictures of sick kids or whatever, you'll see just picture after picture after picture of these kids and you can apply these principles to it where you can look at them and go, it looks like this and kind of move through pretty quickly. So you get an idea of looking at kids and seeing what a sick kid looks like. So this one is the croup video. I'm going to be quiet for a minute. So hopefully you can hear, I'll play it. We'll pause it and look at the kid, talk for a second and then I'll play it and, uh, talk about a few different things inside this video. So this kid right here, when we look at, um, I don't even know if it's a him or a her to tell you the honest truth, because it's maybe, um, but you can see right off that this kid is having a hard time. I don't need to actually hear anything of what's going on with this kid to know that. So, um, he has retractions up by his collarbones. He is like holding his chin out when he's trying to breathe and he just looks really, really lethargic. So that write off is a kid that we know is pretty sick. So now we're gonna watch it for a minute. And uh, this person, whoever the parent is that took this video, cause it's not a, I don't think it's a healthcare facility, is very, very stoic for uh, getting this, this good of a video of a kid this sick. I lost my, oh no, oh no. There we go.
So you see they're actually showing the retractions along the child's rib and along their abdomen there where you can see how much they're kind of sucking in. A kid's breathing should not look that difficult. If you think about a kid who's supposedly sleeping like this one is, they should not have that much difficulty. As a provider, <laughs> I know you guys feel just as awkward, <laughs> excuse me, as I did. When I watched this video, I thought, are they waiting for the ambulance to come now? <laughs> is that what they're doing right while this is happening? I'm just not really sure. This is a very sick croup baby. This is what croup can lead to. This infection where you hear the strider in their breathing, you can hear the wheezing and the, all the way through. Um, and the respiratory distress is pretty significant. This child, if you walked in and heard that and saw it, it would be something that you should be really, really concerned about. That's, this is not an insignificant uh, croup where you think, oh, just put him in a humidified shower and it'll be okay. This is a very, very sick, sick kid. So the next one is an epiglottitis, and this one actually there's a little bit of narrative inside of it because it's an educational video. I feel better about it mostly because this kid is already in the hospital, so I don't feel like he's in as much danger. But um, you'll hear him breathing, and you can actually see and there's like little bits of drool around his mouth, but I'll let the guy talk for a second, and then we'll come back and talk about it as well. So you see with him, his noises were completely different. Uh, this is another thing that for me as a provider was different when I started actually experiencing these kids is that, you know, it's an upper respiratory problem and they all sound the same. That is a completely different noise. And if you think about kind of the physiology behind it with that big giant thing in the back of his throat, 
you can you can kind of imagine it why why he has that gurgling noise right he can't swallow he can't get rid of his own saliva so this is where all of that gurgling and stuff um uh goes around in his mouth so that's that's epiglottitis obviously a very sick kid he's also very obviously very uncomfortable you can see it on his face when he actually moves his head down that there's pain in his face when um he does try to swallow or something like that. So the last one I'll tell you, this is actually my niece. This was, uh, I'm trying to think when it was, the middle of February. Uh, she was born January 1st. My sister-in-law sent me this video and I immediately told her that she needed to go back. She had actually already been at the hospital once and she was discharged. So this one is a lot shorter because I obviously panicked and said you need to <laughs> go to the hospital. But she has RSV, and you'll see a couple of things about it. It's a short video, and then I'll talk about what, what's interesting about it. Can you hear me now? Because I accidentally hung up my phone. So. I can hear you, Emily. Okay, good. Phew. I did a quick panic mode into the uh, computer audio. <laughs> so, so good. Yeah, you can hear me. Um, so <laughs> there is, uh, you can see around her face, you can see her eyes are sunken in. And when she was breathing, you could hear um, the gurgling in her breathing and then also you can see how tired she is so that is a, a weak cry a baby at six weeks old when they cry they wail if you've been around an infant that's upset or not doing very well they will absolutely wail their tiny heads off and this I will play it again for you guys is not a baby who is doing very well it's quite, quite, quite sad, actually, to watch a baby struggle, struggle like this. And she ended up actually spending two weeks intubated in the NICU at Spectrum in Grand Rapids, which was a fascinating experience for all of us, I will say. But she's fine now, I promise. So that, that is RSV. So what are my tips to kind of round all of this out is, one, be around kids. Be around them. See what they're like both sick and not sick because it increases your comfort level and it also gives you better perspective. Trust their parent, like that particular video that I showed you, that was my sister-in-law saying, I was discharged from the hospital. They told me that maybe she has central sleep apnea and I should follow up in a couple of days. Obviously that was not Spectrum who did that, but holy moly you know she's like this is not right and i can't put her down and she stops breathing when a parent says those things to you you need to take that parent seriously stay calm upsetting anyone doesn't help this is where it's really really difficult with parents especially we don't want to upset them any further but they're also can be very difficult for us to work with um kids are res a resilient bunch this is what we have to remember our sick kids, um, they recover most of the time really, really well. And so a good assessment and a good treatment plan goes a long way for them. It will take them into a, you know, a whole healthy, healthy life. Um, and it's a reminder, this, this slide is a reminder of the fact that most kids are pretty healthy. These are my nieces and nephews. Um, the from both sides of the family actually, from just actually, I guess Kelsey's not a child anymore because now she's over the age of 18, but teenagers, preschoolers, school age kids, and here she is. You'll hear my autistic nephew in the background, but she, this is Easter weekend. She is back and normal. I like to show you this so you can, that is how she's supposed to be. 
wiggly, moving around, interacting with the entire universe, that's a healthy kid. So these are healthy kids. We've seen some unhealthy kids. And uh, trying to give you perspective is do the best that you can, be as calm as you can, and that's the, the best, best options. So I think that is all that I have specifically as far as this presentation goes. But I think we're right on time for questions if anybody has any for me. Sorry about that weird audio thing in the middle, but I did punt pretty quickly. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Um, I'm going to go ahead. Um, I'm going to open up the group chat option, actually. So I know a lot of you like to write your questions or comment in the chat box. So I'm going to let you guys use that to, to however you set, you want. But um, I'm also going to unmute the lines for any questions for myself or Emily. Um, and But before I do so, I just wanted to um, remind everybody that I will be emailing everyone after the webinar and it will include an evaluation and quiz link with an attendance form. And again, you will have until Wednesday, May 2nd to complete all forms to receive your credit of education. Um, and then one other thing, I'm gonna have one more webinar for this springtime, which is next month, May 23rd. And I will send out registration for that as well coming soon. Um, but it is during National EMS Week. So if if those of you on the line, if you haven't talked to me or you know, shot me an email or anything, if you guys are doing something at your agency to celebrate National EMS Week, please let me know. You can just shoot me an email. I always love to hear um, what all agencies are doing around Michigan. I can also promote what you're doing as well if it's open to the public. Um, so if you have anything exciting happening, please let me know. Um, but at this time, I will unmute the line. So if anybody has any questions. Are there any comments? Wow. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> Thank you. You guys <laughs> never have it. They didn't have any questions for me the last time either. Uh oh. Does anybody have, there's gotta be one question. Not at all. Emily, do you have any questions for the participants? No, that's okay. Hey, Are you okay. Going, to, going to EMS Expo? You should come and see us there. We're going to be there too. <laughs> I'll say oh, you're yeah, an excellent I presenter. Oh, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Well, all right, I, just to let everyone know, I have recorded this webinar and I will put it on the Michigan Center for Rural Health website, most likely by Friday. Um, so look out for that as well. And again, if you have any questions, you can shoot me an email or give me a call. I am working remotely tonight, so I can only answer your emails, but I will be back in my office tomorrow. But with that, I'm gonna say thanks, Emily, so much. Yeah, well, thank you for having me, guys. Have a good night. Thank you. And Emily, and Emily, thank I will you. see you tomorrow. Oh, community paramedic. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, have a great night. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Thank you.